Nigleria fallora is a single-celled thermophilic amoeba capable of causing primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. This week, Florida saw its 37th case of primary amoebic meningoencephalitis since 1962. With that being said, today on NeuroPsyQ, we're going to discuss what PAM is, how you can contract PAM, the signs and symptoms of PAM, the treatment of PAM, and how to avoid contracting primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. So thanks for joining us again on NeuroPsyQ. If you are a new visitor, make sure to subscribe before we begin. Let's roll the intro. Now first, let's talk about what Nigleria fallori is. Nigleria fallori is an amoeba. An amoeba is not the same as bacteria. This is just a single-celled organism. And we said that Nigleria fallori is thermophilic. This means that it is a heat-loving amoeba. This amoeba can cause the rare infection we mentioned, PAM, primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. Because of the fact that this organism prefers warm temperatures, it's usually found in warm fresh water. So things like lakes, things like hot springs, rivers, streams, especially when the temperature is around 115 degrees Fahrenheit, which is around 46 degrees Celsius. Because of the fact that this amoeba thrives in warm water, most of the cases have been seen in places like Florida and Texas. These are hot spots for primary amoebic flaulori, but with that being said, it's still rare as we mentioned before, only 37 cases have presented in Florida since 1962. Now amoebas survive by eating other organisms, so the amoebas in the water would be eating bacteria that is also present in the water. And Fallori is able to transfer into a cyst form that is resistant to colder temperatures and environmental factors that would prevent its survival. In this state, it survives on low food. When the amoeba is in water that is suitable for its survival, it will be in the flagellated form where it has a flagella and can swim around. During infection, the amoeba tends to be in the trophozoid form. This is a form that's about 10 to 35 micrometers long and this is the form that migrates to the brain via the olfactory nerve. And it's also the form that's found in the cerebrospinal fluid when an individual is infected. So how does the amoeba enter the brain? How would you contract primary amoebic meningoencephalitis? You would have to be swimming in contaminated water, first of all. Like we said, this could be in warm fresh water, things like lakes, streams, or it can also be in pools that are poorly chlorinated. A few cases have happened from tap water in which individuals use uh, neti pots to flush their nose. If the tap water is contaminated with an fallori, then an infection can ensue. What happens is the amoeba gets into the nose. So if you get water up your nose and the amoeba is inside it, the amoeba can then travel via the olfactory nerve into the brain. In fact, if you've watched some of our COVID videos where we talked about anosmia or the loss of the sense of smell in individuals, this is one of the mechanisms that they predict is responsible for COVID causing a loss of sense of smell. If you drink contaminated water, you will not get an infection. The water has to go up your nose and the amoeba then travels to your brain, like we said, via the olfactory nerve, and that is when infection ensues. Primary amoebic meningoencephalitis was first reported in 1965 in Australia by Dr. Fowler, which is where Nigleria fallori gets its name. Three children suffered similar symptoms. Four days before their death, they were lethargic, and then the next day they presented with fever, headache, and sore throat. This was from the bacteria Nigleria fallori, 
and unfortunately nobody knew what it was so the children were treated with antibiotics the doctors were assuming they just had some sort of bacterial infection later on when they moved into the emergency rooms at the hospitals eventually they found the amoeba that was causing the symptoms so we've covered what Nigleria falloris is and how it enters the brain we've also talked a bit about where it is warm fresh water, geothermal springs, poorly maintained pools, water heaters. Now the life cycle of Nigleria falloris also depends on the temperature. So we saw that in colder water it's in the cyst form, in warmer water it tends to be in the trophozoite form. So in the past 10 years we have seen 34 cases, just to give you an idea of how often PAM arises. The symptoms of primary amoebic meningoencephalitis are caused by the destruction of brain tissue. It's like bacterial meningitis. Meningitis is something you've probably heard about before and the meninges are this protective layer around the brain so when you have meningitis that's infected and that region uh, becomes inflamed. Now this is not only meningitis, but it's meningoencephalitis. So the encephaly part means that the brain is also becoming inflamed. So we have inflammation of the brain and inflammation of the meninges. And this is all due to an immune response to this invading amoeba. Around five days after infection, individuals start stage one. And stage one is severe frontal headache, fever, nausea, and vomiting. So at this point, you might be thinking you just have a flu. Stage two sets in a little later, and this stage involves stiff neck, confusion, lack of intention, loss of balance, things like seizures and hallucinations, and eventually it can result in a coma. Most people, unfortunately, die one to 12 days later because of the swelling of the brain. In fact, 97% of individuals pass away. But we have seen survival in 4 out of the 145 cases. The original survivor was an adult who spent one month in the hospital and eventually was released. The only symptom they had was a reduced sensation in their leg after being discharged, but this eventually dissipated. So they gradually improved. The thing is, doctors say that the amoeba found in this individual's brain was a slightly different strain and so they don't think it was as aggressive as the other Nigleria falloris that have been infecting individuals. Along with that two other children have survived. A 12 year old girl survived in 2013. A day before she presented with her symptoms she was at a water park and had got water up her nose, her head was underwater a bunch of times and so doctors later figured out from looking at her cerebral spinal fluid that she was infected with Nigleria falloris. She came to them with fever of 39.4 degrees Celsius. Uh, she also had nausea, vomiting, she was very lethargic, they saw edema in her left frontal lobe hemorrhaging in the brain, and the cerebrospinal fluid was cloudy. They treated her with a bunch of antibiotics, but what was different about her treatment was that she was given this drug being tested called miltefazine. Now miltefazine was actually being developed to treat breast cancer, but they found that this drug was also very toxic to amoebas. And so they treated the young girl with miltefazone, it was an investigational drug and 36 hours later she started to show improvement. They also used therapeutic hypothermia in which the body temperatures dropped and so this cold temperature could help prevent the spread of the amoeba because we know that it is a thermophile. Doctors say that the key to her recovery was the fact that she got early treatment. Just 30 hours after symptoms, she was diagnosed and she was already being put on antibiotics. Another 8-year-old also survived, but this individual had primary brain damage. He was treated also with miltefazone, but the problem was that his treatment began several days after his first symptoms. This individual presented with symptoms in Mexico and when doctors there didn't know what to do, his mother brought him to the United States 
where she sought treatment and when he was diagnosed there, they were able to stop the infection. However, it had been going on for so long that there was brain damage. The most recent case of recovery was in 2016 when a 16 year old was wakeboarding in Florida. The individual presented with the same symptoms. He was treated the same way as the 12 year old girl and he managed to fully recover neurologically and physically. So let's talk a little bit about how doctors diagnose primary amoebic meningioencephalitis. One of the most popular ways to diagnose is by looking at the cerebral spinal fluid. In an individual suffering from meningioencephalitis, the cerebral spinal fluid will be cloudy. This is called purulent cerebral spinal fluid. Now don't look at purulent and think that this means the cerebral spinal fluid is pure. This means that it is cloudy and it looks like there is pus in it. At this point, there's usually a high amount of neutrophil leukocytes, which are white blood cells that attack the amoeba. So we have this cloudy hemorrhagic cerebral spinal fluid with increased cellularity in it and typically low glucose levels and elevated proteins from the immune response. If you take the amoebas that are within the cerebral spinal fluid and you place them in water, they will develop a flagella and they will become flagellates. And so you can also look under a microscope to reveal whether it is, in fact, Nigleria phalloeri. Other methods involve biopsy and some involve H&E staining or also staining with antibodies. And so in this image, you can see the bright neon green spots, which are Nigleria phalloeri stained with antibodies. And so that's one way of identifying it. The other way is H&E staining, a popular method of staining for neuropathologists. And so in this, you can see the cellular state of the amoeba as well within the brain in sort of empty spaces. So they tend to be in ventricular areas or also in areas that they have actually eaten away at. Recently also um, PCR has been developed for identifying Nigleria phalloeri and so there's a specific primer that can be used to identify the DNA of Nigleria phalloeri which is one of the other methods that can be used as well. So the first step to diagnosis would be obviously the patient comes into the hospital, they're presenting with these symptoms. If the doctor suspects that it could be N. phalloeri infecting the individual, they'll run the tests that were mentioned. And so usually in the patient's history, they would say something about being in water recently. If you look at the brain post-mortem, you'll see there's a lot of hemorrhaging where it looks like the amoeba has been eating away at the brain around blood vessels. And so we have hemorrhaging, we have edema, and overall, as the brain is trying to respond to this, it ends up swelling, and the meninges also swell. And this can just cause brain damage. And of course, we know the brain is a very important organ for our survival. So eventually, the individual may present with a coma and they could be announced brain dead. So once diagnosis happens, we, we've talked a little bit about treatment as well. Miltefazine has been showing promise. This is a drug that seems to manage brain swelling. Two individuals have survived that were treated with miltefazine. The third one survived but unfortunately had brain damage. There's also other drugs that manage brain swelling that are given to the individuals. Um, Typically, the individual is put on IV. They're given dexamethasone, which is a corticosteroid that has anti-inflammatory properties. Um, this is actually a drug, interestingly, that's being explored with COVID-19. Its anti-inflammatory properties are just beneficial to people that are suffering from meningioencephalitis. Amphotericin B is another drug that is given to the individuals. This is an antifungal antibiotic and so it is prescribed with hopes to eliminate the amoeba. Fluconolose, it's another antibacterial medicine that's typically introduced and then we have rifampicin which is typically given orally to the individual. After 23 days of treatment with this we saw survival in a 10 year old boy and this was before the exploration of miltefazine.
because it is so rare there hasn't been like a solid treatment plan developed but typically they load the individual with antibiotics and they are now beginning to prescribe miltefazine since it has shown promising results in the past three survivors. We can only hope that the individual that was recently diagnosed in Florida can pull through and that we can happily add to our list of survivors of primary amoebic meningeal encephalitis. As we conclude, you may be wondering, should I be scared of swimming in fresh water? The fact is that this is such a rare disease that if, if you want to take precautionary measures, just avoid warm fresh water. Um, if you're swimming in pools, make sure that they are sanitized and that they are clean. Um, keep your head above water, put in nose plugs, don't be doing front flips underwater or back flips, things that would get water up your nose. Try to enjoy swimming at the same time. Again, it is really rare with only 145 cases having been presented since 1965. That's all for today. Thanks for watching this episode of NeuroPsyQ. We hope to see you next time on Saturday at 8 a.m. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, and stay happy and healthy.